Hello, good evening and a, and a very warm welcome to this event hosted by the Scottish Rewilding Alliance. My name is Peter Cairns, I'm the Executive Director of Rewilding Charity Scotland The Big Picture. Uh, I'm also a member of the Alliance management team and that's the hat that I'm going to be wearing this evening. So the Scottish Rewilding Alliance brings together more than 20 like-minded organisations who share a goal for flourishing ecosystems across Scotland, benefiting nature, climate and people. The Alliance comes together against the backdrop of a biodiversity and climate emergency, recognising that no single organisation can work alone in what is a huge and challenging space. And that really is why we've come together this evening with you guys, only with concerted and collaborative commitment from individuals, from charities, from business, from policymakers, can we hope to address some of these challenges that we all face. So this is what we've got lined up for you in the next hour. We're here tonight primarily to call upon Scotland to become the world's first rewilding nation. And later on, my colleague, Steve Micklewright, will be telling us what that looks like, what it means and why we think it's important. After Steve's presentation, we'll be hearing from Gail Ross. Gail is the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. And after Gail's presentation, we'll be putting some challenging rewilding questions to our panel, who I'll introduce later. Before getting going, I'd just like to thank our funders. Over the last 12 months or so, we've put together quite a wide range of rewilding advocacy tools, including a delightful animation that you'll see for the very first time this evening. None of that would have been possible without the very generous support of the JMG Foundation, the Sigrid Rousing Trust and Wildland Limited. So thank you very much to all of those organisations. So to kick things off, I'd like to go pretty much back to basics and answer three questions. Why are we having this conversation? What is rewilding? And where exactly is Scotland on its rewilding journey? Well, to answer the first question, there's, there's really no way to, to dress this up and sugarcoat it. We're in the eye of a storm. Climate breakdown and global nature loss are crises that are inextricably linked, not only to each other, and, but to the impact that humans are having. I really don't think that's going to come as any great surprise to anyone. But we're having this conversation specifically in Scotland because of this landscape and this one and this one. All of these landscapes pretty much mirror hundreds of others, millions of acres across Scotland's uplands. Despite their unquestionable beauty and drama, these bare glens, rivers and mountains are for the most part ecological vacuums, geological wonders surrounded by centuries of dewilding. Gone are the complex woodland and vegetation communities that once shaped them. Gone are many of the animals that once lived here. And gone too are many of the people that once lived here. So much of Scotland's beauty and drama lies dormant, muted, some might say dying. So we're having this conversation because of an illness that has taken hold. It's not a, an illness that is unique to Scotland or Britain, but it is certainly prevalent here. It's a condition that has led to Scotland becoming one of the most nature depleted countries in the world in terms of the biodiversity that we've lost. It's a condition that has led us to a point where our bare nature depleted glens are not only accepted as normal, but actually cherished and celebrated by many people. It's a condition called ecological blindness. And this is a quote from a young ecologist, Gus Routledge. Many of us suffer from ecological blindness. We don't see the degraded landscapes and the animals we've lost because we're not conditioned to look. And Gus is absolutely right. Most people don't see the need to fix our landscapes because they don't perceive that they're broken. So one of the catalysts for the Alliance calling for a rewilding nation is that 2021 marks the beginning of the United Nations decade for ecosystem restoration. This is the first time there's ever been a global movement to restore 
and recover our degraded living systems rather than simply trying to protect the fragments and threads of nature that we have left. But to arrest and reverse the cultural and economic super tanker that has brought us to this point requires a huge global effort. We need to think big, we need to think bold, we need to stretch our imaginations to what is possible, not just settle for what is easy. We can't address exponential loss with incremental change. Desperately holding on to those fragments and threads of nature, those tiny green boxes that are our nature reserves or protected sites, it isn't enough. We need rewilding. So what is rewilding? Scotland, a land of majestic vistas and thrilling wildlife, where the clouds scud fast and the skies light up like magic, where the wee bit glen meets the mighty ben, and wait, look around, our landscapes are grand, but there's more to this picture than meets the eye. Why is so much of our land so bare? Where's the life that was once there? A mighty medley of creatures once filled Scotland's woodlands, wetlands and seas. Life hummed and thrummed, weaved and wallowed, butted and bellowed. And people were part of it all, in tune with extraordinary rhythms of life. But over time we changed. We fell out of step with those precious beats, pushing creatures to extinction and squandering our seas and soils. Our land today is emptier, poorer, our wildlife fragmented, muted. But tomorrow can be different. We can reconnect with the rhythms and help nature flourish. We call it rewilding. It turns up the volume on nature, allowing it to grow and flow, bloom and boom. Filling our landscapes with a riot of colour and song, the great web of life that supports our health and well-being. Rewilding gives us the chance to create a future where the lynx can roam and rivers run wild, where birds fly free and woodlands thrive, where we move in tune with those magnificent beats and the wonder of life bursts back to our land and seas. Rewilding is an opportunity to return abundance and diversity of life to our degraded ecosystems. It's an opportunity for Scotland to lead the way in transforming its land and seas so that they work in all their colorful complexity. It's an opportunity to stitch back together a tapestry of life where natural processes drive vibrant living systems. Processes like predator prey dynamics, processes like carcass scavenging, and nutrient cycling. Rewilding is about encouraging rivers shaded by corridors of alder and willow to run as they want to, as they need to, allowing natural debris like fallen trees to accumulate in river channels, enriching the water for insects and bird life, creating pools for rivers full of salmon and trout. Rewilding is about connectivity across the landscape, encouraging native woodland to expand, binding soils, regulating our climate, creating wildlife highways for red squirrels to move from tree to tree. Rewilding is understanding that a forest is much more than just a sea of trees. It's a complex community of soil microbes, lichens, mosses, shrubs, tiny trees, huge trees, dead and dying trees, all coming together as a constantly evolving system. Rewilding is about re-wetting, restoring Scotland's peatlands that across huge areas have been drained and burned, giving them a chance to purify our water and to store carbon, as well as providing a home for some of our most precious wildlife. Rewilding is acknowledging that a peatland or a forest or a wetland or a river is actually less of a physical entity and more a set of dynamic processes with no predetermined end point. And of course, rewilding cannot stop at the shoreline. The principles of rewilding 
don't stop on land. Abundance and, and diversity in our seas is, is also not what it should be, what it could be. From top predators down to tiny plankton, the sea, just like the land, is, a, is an ecological engine, a machine that needs all of its parts to function as it should. Rewilding asks us all to think differently, to reconsider our place in the natural order as just one species among many. It's as much a philosophical change in mindset as it is a physical change to the land and the sea. At its most basic level, rewilding is anything that counteracts more dewilding, anything that joins up and enriches habitats rather than further fragment and degrade them, anything that results in more wildlife and not less wildlife. Rewilding is a journey, it's a process. So where exactly is Scotland right now on that journey? Well, there are huge challenges. There's no getting away from that, let's be absolutely clear. But there are also many stories that show what is possible, that provide the encouragement and the foundation for a rewilding nation. Red kites have returned to Scottish skies in the last 30 years, ditto white-tailed eagles. Ospreys are now breeding in greater numbers than at any time in modern history. And of course, pine martins have bounced back almost from the brink of extinction and in many places have become a major tourist attraction, just like the bottlenose dolphins of the Murray Firth, which are now said to be worth something in the region of six million pounds each year to the wider Inverness economy. And there are whales, big whales, increasingly being sighted in Scottish waters. We know how to translocate and reintroduce threatened or extinct species. This unfortunate in some ways, this red squirrel is part of a project moving them from where they're abundant to form new populations in the Northwest Highlands. And of course, we know that beavers are now back doing their beavery work in Scotland's rivers and wetlands after an absence of 400 years. And the Alliance wants to see more native species restored so that they in turn can help restore vibrant, dynamic living systems. Ecological restoration, nature recovery, rewilding, I personally don't mind what you call it. It's finding its way into the mainstream in places like Glen Affric, in places like Cairngorms Connect. Young forests are on the march for the first time in generations. Peatlands are being restored and natural processes are being allowed to shape and govern the landscape. River restoration is now firmly established like here on the Rottle Burn in Angus, where a stretch of river that was engineered, straightened over a hundred years ago has been re-naturalized, re-meandered and allowed to connect with its floodplain. There are more trees, more flowers, more insects, more fish, cleaner water and less flooding. Craig Meggie is another landscape scale restoration initiative. Ditto Allerdale in Sutherland, ditto Ben A in Westeros and ditto Koyak and Ascent in the Northwest. Now, of course, none of these landscapes will transform overnight, but they're on the rewilding journey. And it's tempting to think that these estates all belong to big landowners or, or conservation groups, but this is Carafran in the Scottish borders. 20 years ago, this glen was completely bare, but now a wild wood is creeping up the hillsides thanks to the inspiring commitment of a small group of individuals who came together to effect positive change. And this is urban rewilding, if you like. This is the Cumbern Old Living Landscape Project where nature is being encouraged right into the heart of one of our busiest towns. These are just a few from a growing list of exciting projects bringing about ecological change. But what is crucial here, what is crucial for the future of rewilding, not only across Scotland, but across the world, is that this process, this journey, is not at the expense of people. Rewilding doesn't mean depeopling. quite the opposite. Jobs are already being created in projects like Cairngorms Connect. Young people 
are being given the chance to forge a career, a livelihood. Rewilding needs to demonstrate that nature rich landscapes are not only beneficial ecologically, but they have a tangible economic and social value to local communities through a diverse range of nature based enterprises. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about people. When most of us talk about rewilding, we talk about regenerating habitats or, or bringing back lost species. But in many ways, this is the easy bit. We know how to do the physical stuff. The greater challenge lies with people's hearts and minds. Rewilding challenges the preconceptions many people have about what Scotland should look like. Many people cherish those Bear Glens. They're familiar, they're comfortable. So the key to the rewilding door rests with people's perceptions, their values, their priorities in life, their personal belief systems. Rewilding is about a, a change in mindset, overcoming that ecological blindness and seeing the landscape through fresh eyes, accepting nature as an ally and not as something to be tamed and conquered. I think it's probably fair to say that the rewilding debate is, is very often characterized by a, a narrative of despair and division. It focuses on what Scotland isn't and whose fault that is, rather than what it could be. Change is never easy and it rarely happens by forcing people to change. We need to unite around shared solutions to the challenges we face, not only as individuals, not only as a society, but as a species. And I believe we can do that. You've only got to go back 70 years, just a human lifetime, and red squirrels were being killed in their tens of thousands for a bounty. They were treated as vermin. Today, that would be unthinkable. Everyone loves red squirrels. So attitudes change, priorities change, and the perception of rewilding is changing from it being a threat into it being a huge opportunity. So I'd just like to finish with, with two quotes. The first is from Doug Chadwick, a renowned wildlife biologist who says, the essence of nature is wholeness, a wholeness woven from infinite complexity. Trying to save nature piece by piece doesn't make sense, even if we had all the time in the world, and we most certainly do not. The second quote is actually more of a rallying call. Um, it's from the United Nations website, and, and it should leave us in no doubt that ecosystem restoration or, or rewilding isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. Restoration is a monumental task. Over the next 10 years, every action counts. Every single day, every country, company, organization, and individual has a role to play. Well, the Scottish Rewilding Alliance will certainly do its best to play its role, but this is a job for the whole of Scotland. It's a job that can really only be achieved by a rewilding nation. So I'd now like to introduce Steve Micklewright. Steve is the convener of the Alliance. His day job is actually as, a chief, as chief executive at Trees for Life. But tonight he's here to tell us what a rewilding nation looks like and why it's needed. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Pete. Uh, my name is Steve Micklewright. I'm the convener of the Scottish Rewilding Alliance and also the CEO of Trees for Life. I'm going to speak for the next few minutes about why we need a rewilding nation, what that really means, and how we can make it happen. So why do we need a rewilding nation? We hear about single solutions for very specific issues all the time. We're told to plant more trees for climate change, create nature reserves to save wildlife, build flood defences to stop the town from flooding, and we have quotas to stop overfishing. But sadly, single solutions can result in damage somewhere else or to something else. So that's why I think we need a rewilding nation. Planting trees in the wrong place can damage nature and biodiversity. 
creating nature reserves inevitably mean that the rest of the land is forgotten about. Flood defences usually move the problem somewhere else, while fishing quotas create bycatch, which means that fish are simply thrown away. But rewilding is a concept that can solve a lot of problems at the same time. If we restore our natural peatlands, they lock away carbon, restore nature and prevent flooding. So does regenerating native woodland and so does re-meandering rivers to take them back to their natural course. And having no take zones allows seas to recover, restoring wildlife, fishing stocks, and they can lock away carbon too. And rewilding also asks us to work with nature and this means that the work can be done a lot more cheaply. For example, translocating beavers to new river systems in Scotland could manage floodwaters, restock rivers with salmon and trout and benefit countless insects, birds and other wildlife. And beavers do that for free. Reintroducing links to Scotland could help control deer numbers, helping forests to regenerate naturally, saving money on deer culling and tree planting. These are just some of the elements of rewilding. But imagine if we embraced it as a concept, as a whole country, just imagine what improvements we could see. So what is a rewilding nation? We think a rewilding nation is one that thinks differently about its problems and works with nature to solve them, not against it. As Pete showed in his presentation, quite a lot of rewilding is already going on in Scotland, but much of this has been done against the tide of government policy. If Scotland declared itself the world's first rewilding nation, it would mean things would have to change from the top down. We think there are three things that need to be done to get started. Firstly, the government should commit to ensuring large areas, and that's at least 30% of Scotland's land and sea are rewilded over the next 10 years. Secondly, funding should be redirected so that we work with nature and not against it especially in agriculture, forestry and development. And thirdly, we should learn the lessons of the pandemic and start to rewild our communities from streets to parks to school grounds to road verges, allowing us all to reconnect with nature and benefit mentally, physically and emotionally from the work it does for us. Members of the Scottish Rewilding Alliance show every day in their work that rewilding is possible. Now we need to mainstream it and make working with nature the starting point for the big decisions made on all of our behalf by the government. And we know that the people of Scotland support this because we recently did an opinion poll about rewilding. The poll undertaken by Servation showed that 73% of Scots support rewilding and significantly only 7% oppose it. This shows how much people understand that something needs to change. 57% support rewilding being added to the government's economic strategy, and once again, only 7% oppose it. This shows that Scots want to see real investment in rewilding, not just empty words from the government. 76% support beavers being moved to new areas of Scotland instead of being killed when they are causing problems only 5% oppose this. And perhaps surprisingly, 52% support the reintroduction of links to Scotland, while 19% oppose it. All this polling shows that Scotland wants to be a rewilding nation. So how can we make it happen? The first part of any journey is deciding by willing on the government to declare the world's first rewilding nation before COP26. There are some really good reasons why this is in the government's interest to do that. Firstly, the United Nations have declared the 2020s as the decade of ecosystem restoration. This means rewilding. Secondly, the Scottish government have committed to bold action on this by signing something called the Edinburgh Declaration. And thirdly, declaring the rewilding nation would put Scotland at the forefront of this journey and commit the country to actually doing something new and different. To make this happen, we need your help. Can I appeal to everyone who has joined this event to, firstly, share the animation with your MSP 
and ask them to support the motion to call for a rewilding nation. Secondly, share the animation on your social media and encourage your friends to get involved. And finally, tell us why you think Scotland should become a rewilding nation via our Facebook and Twitter feeds. You can find more details about all of that at our website, rewild.scot. That's all I wanted to say. So back to you, Pete. Thank you, Steve. And um, yeah, hats off for, for battling through those obvious internet challenges. It's the price you pay for living in the middle of a forest. Um, I've just heard actually, unfortunately, that Gail Ross can't join us this evening. So we're gonna move very quickly to our panel. We have questions uh, and these are the people that are gonna answer them. We have Rebecca Wrigley. Rebecca is Chief Executive at Rewilding Britain. We have Tom Bowser, who's Head Ranger at Argety Red Kites near Stirling. We have Nick Underdown, who's Head of Campaigns and Communications at Open Seas. And we have Gordon Buchanan, who I'm sure is known to most of you for his work with behind a camera and also in front of a camera, appears regularly on our TV screens. Um, just before I come to some of the audience questions, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to pick on you, Rebecca, uh, just to answer a question that has cropped up today, because just today the Scottish Government have responded to our call for a rewilding nation uh, by effectively claiming that they're already doing it. Now, they cite that 37% of Scottish seas are now marine protected areas, and there's a, a voluntary commitment to protect 30% of Scottish land by 2030. I guess the burning questions are, um, a, are, are, these, are these just paper designations, but perhaps more relevantly um, around the word protection. I think the word protection is interesting here. So given the fact that much of our landscape and seas are already depleted, is protection alone enough or do we have to ramp up the ambition and, and really actively pursue restoration and recovery or, or rewilding? Rebecca. <laughs> well, in a sense, you've answered your own question there, Pete, because. Um, I mean, first, I'd like to applaud all the efforts that are already going on. Um, I mean, both you and Steve have talked about them in your in your in your talks, um, and it's it's a fantastic commitment um, the Scottish government has made, but it's not enough. Um, uh, so, protecting um, areas without recovery, their recovery and restoration and rewilding isn't enough, that's what we feel. So um, we would like to see our protected areas and national parks. We'd like to see wilder areas in those protected areas and national parks, but also beyond. Um, we'd like to see, for instance, the recognition of, of the value of nature-based and natural climate solutions like rewilding. Um, and that will require um, not just protection um, not just restoration and rewilding, but also um, regulation and enforcement of those protections, but also funding. So just, to, just to, as an example, for instance, we know that um, natural climate solutions like rewilding can make a 30% contribution to climate mitigation, but only currently get 3% of the funding. That's globally, not just in Scotland. So I think the, the recognition of the contribution that rewilding as a natural climate solution, as a nature-based solution, um, it, it is not sufficient. Okay, thank you very much. Nick, you've got your hand up. Just to uh, echo something that, we, that you said, um, just on the marine issue. So yes, it's true that 37% of Scotland's territorial uh, sea area is covered by some form of designation. So it's, you know, by some people's reckoning protected. But I think there's, if you look behind what is actually going on there, those protected areas are not actually protecting uh, the life in our sea. They are literally paper parks and the management has not been implemented yet. So, you know, we've got really good legislation in this country. It's brilliant. Uh, you know, we have a duty on our Scottish government to enhance the health of Scotland's marine area. It's brilliant. Um, but we're just not actually doing it very fast. Um, so if we were to do what you know we are legally obliged to do as a country, but also you know, what makes sense to do, then we'd be in good shape. But you know, just to, as a quick example, you know, fi only five percent of Scotland's inshore waters is protected from uh, bottom toed fishing. You know, which sweeps across the seabed and damages uh, marine habitats. You know, that is not what people expect. 
from protected areas. So I guess I guess the, the take home message really is is be wary of be wary of terminology and designations. Gordon, um, I've got a, a really spicy question. There's a few spicy questions coming actually. Um, this one in particular from Stuart Adair, who says, should the whole of the Cairngorms National Park be rewilded and managed as a proper national park? His words, not mine. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly big enough, but it's currently in a pretty poor state in comparison to what it could be. What do you think? Yeah, um, yeah. proper national park is a sort of interesting term and that's sort of possibly, you know, maybe people that have visited national parks around the, the world and through my work, most of the time I'm working in some a national park or a, a, a protected area. Uh, and often you arrive at these national parks and there's a very clear boundary there that it goes from a kind of human dominated landscape into a wild, a wild area. And I think with the Cairngorms, the Loman and Trossachs National Park, there are clearly some phenomenal parts to both of those, those areas. But I always have a bit of a wry smile when I see the you know, very grand introduction and sign to tell you that you're, you're entering a national park. And you think, well, where, where does it actually start? Uh, there's a lot of landscapes that are, you know, you can see repeated sort of throughout Scotland, you know, but you enter the, um, the Cairngorms National Park, there's so much of that land that is, is almost entirely devoid of, of life and it doesn't represent what those ecosystems are capable of, uh, of holding. Um, obviously, to rewild all of it, you've got a, a you know a community the living in there. You've got all that infrastructure. Uh, you've got other sort of farming interests, estate interests. But I think certainly currently, with sort of so much of it not being protected and so much of it being open open moorland, I would say that there's there's an opportunity, or could be an opportunity, or should be an opportunity to create sort of the jewel in the crown of Scotland's wild wild places. And there are parts, as I said, of, of the Cairngorms that, you know, that are, are, are beautiful, that seem pristine. But I think if there's an opportunity to create a truly wild um, ecosystem that sort of, it could lead the way, it could show, um, you know, not just the rest of, of, of our country, but it could show the world what can be, what can be done, uh, what can be restored. And I think it's crazy. This is a sort of an opportunity, you know, so many people in, in, in the UK will stick their hand up and sign petitions and you know, cry out about the loss of habitats around the world. And it's, the same should be true that we should be as passionate about restoring what we've, what we've lost. Because what right do we have to say to Brazil, to say to African nations, this is what you should be doing with your your wild places, because quite rightly they could turn around and say, "Well, what are you doing to restore what you've what you've lost, um, to restore the, the, the mend the damage that you've done?" So I think, yeah, I I would hope that in the future the Cairngorms will look a lot wilder wilder than it currently does, and instead of it being sporadic, it's kind of a whole that once you actually enter that national park, that any visitor a resident will say, yeah, this is this is what it should look like. This is what it could look like. Brilliant. OK, um, can I come to Tom next? Um, Tom, here's an interesting question from Alex Hamilton, who says quite rightly that the majority of Scots live in urban or semi urban areas. And, and while he acknowledges that we can't create a Glen Africa in the middle of Glasgow, <clears throat> although some people would argue it would be a nice thing, um, we can and should have wild areas in and close to our cities. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. It's a great question. I totally agree. I think if this last year has shown us anything, it's that people need wild places, need contact with wild worlds. And I hope that will bring about changes going forward. I think when you look around the world, there's lots of really good examples of urban rewilding going on in countries like New Zealand and Canada. In Canada, in Vancouver, apparently they have 220 parks. In one of them is a forest with trees 200 years old, and wouldn't that be amazing if one day we had that in Glasgow or Edinburgh? Um, I think there is some really good work going on at the moment in Scotland. Butterfly Conservation, for example, are doing really good work in Glasgow and Edinburgh. 
changing parks from really places with grass and trees and not a lot else into something a lot more rich and biodiverse, planting loads of wildflower meadows, which is great. Um, I think Glasgow University are doing lots of stuff as well. Um, planting wildflowers is certainly a lot more than when I was a student there. Um, in Stirling, close to where we are here, there's the organisation on the verge who are doing brilliant work getting the council to consider more sympathetic mowing regimes so that they're not just cutting down every single wildflower just as they start to come out, which is really good. I think probably that we have to be realistic that um, although every win at the moment is a big win for us and we should try and rewild as much as we can so every act in urban areas is good and valuable, I think probably the big challenge is for Scotland and where the battle will be won and lost to improve the environment will be in the countryside. As the question says, only 17% of people live in rural areas, 80% of our landmass is farmland. So to me, I think it's farmland that we really need to improve and the marine environment as well if we are to really win the overall battle. But every, every act is valuable. I think the, the question re regarding um urban areas it brings in this concept of connectivity doesn't it you know we, we we don't have to think in terms of siloed and compartmentalized sections of the landscape we need to look at it as a whole as a system um, that needs to be you know have oil poured into that engine to function as it should and that applies equally to urban areas as it does to rural areas okay um nick this is a quite a challenging one um sarah hardy sent this in what steps need to be taken to ensure our oceans are rewilded? I feel you've got to take a deep breath here. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is, um, that's, uh, that's a bit of a... <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think the first step is actually just very simple and is, is about bringing people on board. I think that's got to be the first step before you start talking about what we need to do what our seas, what measures we might need to take in terms of rewilding on the ground, we need to we need to talk as a country with each other. Uh, we need to get the facts out about what rewilding means, which is what this uh, this is all about. What we're trying to do just now, um, and to tool people up in the areas that they live to be able to have those conversations um, in the places where they live, uh, and. You know, for the marine area, that's a really interesting issue because we have coastal areas uh, where a lot of people are connected to the sea through uh, marine industries, uh, fishing, but also energy developments, all sorts of different industries bring people into contact with the sea. And we um, need to, in, you know, share the information, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge that we are uh, gathering around this rewilding agenda uh, so that people can make decisions within, within their own communities about the kind of steps that we need to take as a society. So that is the first step. And I really can't overstate that. You know, it's pretty um, overwhelming to know how many people are watching this uh, broadcast as we're talking. You know, I would just entreat everyone to talk with each other. We need to speak with each other and get outside of our, you know, we, we kind of assume that we all are on board with this idea. We've got an interest in it. But a lot of people don't know about this stuff. So we need to share this. Um, so that'd be the first step, and that's a step they need to take all the way through, I would suggest. Um, you know, there's some really good stuff that is already happening on the ground around our coasts. Uh, there are communities that are beginning to actually, you know, take action into their own hands. You know, you've got guys uh, around Loch Craignish that are reintroducing lost oyster reefs, incredible work. Um, you've got uh, Project Seagrass looking to reseed uh, seagrass beds. You know, for example, in the Outer Hebrides, we've lost a quarter of our seagrass beds in the last 10 years. You know, this is this is with these supposed protected areas in place, you're still losing these habitats. And these habitats are vitally important for, you know, carbon sequ sequestration, as Steve said in the introduction. These are really important habitats and we're losing them literally under our watch in our generation. So um, some of those, that really good kind of outlier community activism is happening. Uh, so talk to those people, find out, learn from what they're doing. Um, and Lamlash Bay, you know, Steve in his introduction highlighted what happens when you leave the seabed alone. And I think this is just a very fundamental point. What, what are the steps involved? Give our seabed a rest. You know, the seabed is 
the engine for our marine ecosystems. It's covered by a mosaic of habitats that are no less uh, diverse than, that, than those on land. We need to just look after our seabed better. At the turn of the 20th century, we were sweeping 50% of the North Sea with bottom contact uh, mobile fishing gear. At the, at the turn of the 21st century, so just 20 years ago, that had risen to 90%. So we are just having this profound footprint on our marine area. And we've got to, we've got to start rewinding that. 37% um, is protected. You know what that actually looks like on the ground. We are putting little circles around relics of the habitats that once carpeted our inshore seas. You know, so we need to not just look at protected areas, we not need to look at that connectivity between these uh, protected areas and start to, to, to rewild broader areas of our seascapes. And that is, that is more fish because habitat is really important for fish. So this is, about, this is about generating productivity within our environment, not about reducing it or turning it into you know, some sort of uh, wild area not to be used, not to be worked within. Um, I could go on. Uh, I think I'll uh, stop myself there. I'd love, love to speak to anyone who's interested in marine rewilding. Brilliant. Thanks, Nate. You always speak very passionately about the oceans. I think one thing that surprised me when I found this out many years ago now is that, and correct me if I've got this wrong, but it's something like six times the, the surface area of the earth that, that Scotland and its territory occupies is taken up by sea as yeah. opposed to land. So, you know, it, it could legitimately be argued that six times the amount of resource that we put into land restoration should be put into marine restoration. I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't uh, argue with that. I think yeah. it's a strategic thing to do, um, you know, and, and we're learning now that our seabed is a huge carbon store. I mean, we could, we could go into that, but it's, it's a really profound point. Um, you know, that I think I'm struggling to recall the exact statistic, but it's something like, you know, basically the top, uh, the top section of our seabed holds more carbon in it than, uh, you know, equivalent carbon rich stores on land. Um, so it makes sense to protect those known carbon stores. Absolutely. Okay. Two, um, two species related questions now. Um, first to Rebecca. This is from uh, Jim Cuthbert, who asks which, rather contentiously, which large herbivores could or should be reintroduced into existing rewilding projects? Um, another great question. Um, I suppose I would rather cheekily um, ask what he might mean by large. So I, I don't know how many people know that as little as 10,000 years ago, straight tusked elephants roamed this country, um, these islands. Um, now, I, I probably wouldn't be advocating for the <laughs> reintroduction of elephants as the largest herbivore. And, and of course, in all seriousness, it's, it's, it's much more, uh, as I think Pete, you said in your talk, talk earlier, it's, it's much more about the balance between herbivores and predators. It's about the balance between um, all the species and the web of life, the complex, diverse, abundant web of life that we want to see restored. Um, so, and it's about maintaining those, those levels in a, in a sustainable way that can, can, can enhance and, and recreate and, um, and restore that kind of wonderful mosaic of, of woodland, scrub, uh, wood pasture, so we need our herbivore uh, at sustainable levels, particularly in terms of, of deer numbers um, in Scotland. Um, but we, I, I'd love to see a, a wider diversity of herbivores. Um, so, uh, for, for example, beavers actually are a herbivore so, uh, and also a keystone species. So they uh, engineer the environment around them to create niches for far more species and, and to sort of kickstart and um, give rocket fuel to the to the abundance of uh, of nature around them um wild boar while it's a bit cheeky because they're not really a herbivore but they yeah, i mean they but they provide a role of of scuffling up um and digging up and providing um niches for for, for pioneer species to move into but i suppose if i was asked to, to to pick a large herbivore that i would like to see reintroduced i think it would probably be the the elk or the canadian moose that w was here uh, in Britain uh, as little as two or three thousand years ago. Um, what a wonderful species that would that would be. Um, lives in, in woodlands and, and wetlands um, 
uh, but obviously any reintroduction um, has to be with and um, with the support of and involvement of, of local communities uh, and within the guidelines, um, it's kind of IUCA guidelines. So it has to be done cautiously, carefully, uh, and with consideration. I, I, again, reiterating what Nick was saying. I mean, for us, rewilding is just as much about um, about people as it is about nature. Uh, we are part of nature. We're part of that intricate web of life. And we have to support and be part of the solution of rewilding. Okay. Well, I suppose if I'm honest, no, no uh, webinar of this ilk would be complete without um, talk around a large predator. So Gordon being the large predator man amongst us, um, I'm gonna come up to you with two questions. Well, actually one question from Elliot Weir, but I should mention Peter Fox um, and, and, and many others actually have asked uh, questions around links. But Elliot's question is, considering that apex predators are a key aspect to the Scottish or any ecosystem, what is your reaction to the clear rejection of the links by the NFUS, National Farmers Union for Scotland, of course, and do you believe that reintroduction is possible without their support? Tricky one, that. Um, it, it is. that the, One way of looking at it is to sort of turn that question around and say that we had a lynx population in this country and there was call to eradicate those animals uh, by those whose interests they feel threat they, they are, are threatened. Of course, that would never be be pushed through. But I think, you know, it has to, these conversations have to be had with the relevant parties. And I think the real danger is that there's a kind of a them and us scenario. And so these dialogues have, have to be had and it has to be looked at for the, the, the good of uh, the countryside, for the good of society and for the sort of the good of future generations, the type of um, uh, Scotland that they want to want to live in. I think I'm not surprised by the NFU's response to, to that. That's as I would predict. But I grew up on the Isle of Mull. I worked on a croft. I was sort of um, very connected to the, the farming community and crofting community there. I think back in the 80s, if you were to ask any croft or any farmer on the Isle of Mull, say, what do you feel about the reintroduction, the fact that these white-tailed eagles are showing up on, on this island? And I would have, you'd struggle to have found any of them that would say that it was a good thing for them personally. But now, you know, 30 years on, you would struggle to find any farmer on the island that would say that this has not been a really positive thing for the future of the island com um, community, that it provides jobs, it provides huge revenue. Um, and, you know, I think it's sort of reintroduction of predators and things that sort of steals the headlines and really we sort of shouldn't forget the fact this is about sort of restoring the balance in nature, restoring these natural mechanisms. And predators are just one part of, of that. Um, and I think it's sort of really important that that's sort of, it's not, you know, it's not black and white. I remember I went to Yellowstone and met with Doug Smith, who was instrumental in bringing wolves back to Yellowstone. And, and he sort of, he had a sort of position almost on the fence that he said, okay, these wolves are protected in this area. And we can't protect them. We can't say to ranchers on the outside that they should be protected once they leave that um, that protected protected area. And that's the balance that has to be has to be struck. And it's not always harmonious. But I think you know that's we shouldn't be fausting predators on on people. It has to be done through dialogue and discussion and with the long term in, in sight. Uh, and it's a logical step, especially for a species like, like lynx, because they would be at, at home very, very quickly in lots of places around, around Scotland. And it would be many, many years before anyone even detected the presence of, of those animals, but they would be working their magic and contributing to those ecosystems in, uh, in that unique way. I, I mean, I often find it bizarre, as I'm sure you do, that, that you know, we would be, we would recoil in horror if, if we thought, you know, India was going to eradicate its tigers or mm -hmm. Africa was going to eradicate its lions. And, and yet here we are in Britain being one of the 
only European countries refusing to live with with large predators and and links in in particular. Um, and, and I'm sure that you know many people who oppose the reintroduction of links into Scotland would again recoil in horror at the prospect of having them wiped out across their natural range. So you know there is a question to say, well, why should France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Belgium, why should these countries live with these animals and we're not prepared to play our part in that process? So yeah, but it is as you say, it's a it's a contentious and and <clears throat> in some ways unnecessarily inflammatory subject. Um, and certainly when you get involved into those sort of tribal arguments, then it becomes even more complex. Tom. Yeah, I was just going to chip in on that, guys, and just say, I think um, that there's still some work to be done with the farming community just to rebuild trust with them um, on some of these issues. I know a few farmers on the West Coast who still feel very much like they were lied to. I think that, you know, white-tailed eagles wouldn't come and take lambs ever. And um, I think that's caused a lot of resentment going forward. Um, I think with the links reintroduction, and I should say I would support that, but um, I think if we're going to do it, I think we have to have a focus on what happens if livestock are predated. I think as a rewilding movement, you know, we're very good at knowing what we want to do and why we want to do it. We can be very clear about that. I think sometimes we need to focus a bit on the how. I also think you were on a podcast the other night, Pete, with Patrick Laurie, the author and farmer, who said that there's an element to rewilding that can quite easily get quite negative. Um, and I notice that sometimes when I'm looking at these things with my farming hat on that, um, you know, it feels like some people are only a step away from saying that all farmers are psychopaths or murderers or all these things. And I think we need to try and make sure that whatever we're doing, we're being open and that we're trying to keep dialogue positive with this. Mm. Can I just Interesting. Say, Sorry, Gordon, go on. I, no, I was going to say that the, the one thing about it, the reintroduction of, of any sizable animal, in, it's, in Scotland, it's actually far more controllable than it ever would have been in the past through through technology so for example you know what you don't want and it's in no one's interest to have a a, a predator links in the wild that are going to sort of um come into conflict with any community um but i was thought with any introduction with satellite tagging there's an opportunity to track and follow those even if it was even if you had um, you know, Scotland was at saturation point with with lynx. In the future, we are going to be able to monitor these animals, you know, far, far better, much more closely, so that you can sort of um, avoid those conflict zones. There's a situation in um, in Kenya at the moment where the Maasai community, who are pastoralists with big cattle herds, instead of um, the rejecting lions from the the the, the land that they own and, and manage. The, there's communities that are working along, working together and working with the lines. And one of the, with the issues that they have is they have attract um, track lines within that group and they can avoid the conflict. So they can they can phone ahead or text these communities and say, okay, the pride has moved into this into this area. So be vigilant, make sure that your cattle are kind of uh, are kept an eye on. And the same would go for links in, in Scotland. If they're satellite tagged and they were moving into a kind of conflict zone, um, people could be could be alerted. Um, there's also other ways with, you know, I was involved in a project, I'll try and keep this quick, but using thermal imaging drones that can identify every wild living um, warm blooded animal in a habitat and even in forest forested habitats. And they're working on systems that you can actually fly automated drone flights that will fly over an area and count how many red squirrels you have, count many, how many how many links, how many people. And this is something that I think will happen in the in in wild places around the world. Is that you'll have these automated drones that are not just counting species, but looking for poaching sort of for illegal activities. And sadly, the, the wild has to be monitored in that kind of, in that way. Um, but it's not an impossibility. And I would hate to think that any kind of, you know, um, party thought that this was something that simply couldn't, couldn't work because it, it could. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, Nick, just, um, we're, we're running out of time a little bit. So if you could maybe keep this short, but a question from, and this is quite a politically charged question, I have to say from Andy Payton, who says, 
can Scotland really be considered as a rewilding nation when the Scottish government continues to support the hugely environmentally damaging salmon fish farming industry? Briefly, if you can, I know, I know it's a, a complex situation, but as briefly as you can. Um, I think the short answer is, uh, is no, if we stay on the trajectory that we're on. Um, you know, we, we're aware that this is a journey uh, the rewilding journey and that we can't just rewild things overnight and by the same token the condition of our salmon aquaculture industry in Scotland which many people up and down the west coast of Scotland in particular have got deep concerns about or some people do uh, you know that can't change overnight um, but the industry has got to and the Scottish government have got to um, really turn things around uh you know be, being a rewilding nation is about is an aspiration and uh we're not going in the right direction around uh salmon farm aquaculture unfortunately um the decline of wild populations of salmon is a, is a national shame and i think many people are beginning to understand quite how uh quite how much our salmon and sea trout populations have declined over the years the, fact, the reasons for that are multifactorial and do not just uh, lie uh, around salmon farming, for sure. There are lots of complex factors at play, but it, it's not helping right now. Um, so the short answer is no, but it could. Um, yeah, I get where you can I understand. Okay, um, we're just about running out of time, actually. So we, we're going to wrap things up um, for the evening. Thank you very much indeed to you guys, our panel. Thanks to Steve um, for speaking earlier on. Just a, a very quick um, secondary thank you to our funders, but primarily thank you, the audience, for being with us this evening and showing your interest and support. Um, we're going to close with a rerun of the Rewilding Nation animation, which I should have said uh, earlier, actually. I'm sure you picked up that Gordon very kindly narrated that for us. Um, if you like it, and I really think you should, please share it far and wide. If you live in Scotland, please do share it with your MSP and the uh, follow-up to this event that will come through to you will give you all the relevant links to do that. But in the meantime, thanks for joining us once again. Have a safe evening. And this is what a rewilding nation could look like. Scotland, a land of majestic vistas and thrilling wildlife, where the clouds scud fast and the skies light up like magic where the wee bit glen meets the mighty ben, and wait, look around, our landscapes are grand, but there's more to this picture than meets the eye. Why is so much of our land so bare? Where's the life that was once there? A mighty medley of creatures once filled Scotland's woodlands, wetlands, and seas. Life hummed and thrummed, weaved and wallowed, butted and bellowed. And people were part of it all, in tune with extraordinary rhythms of life. But over time, we changed. We fell out of step with those precious beats, pushing creatures to extinction and squandering our seas and soils. Our land today is emptier, poorer, our wildlife fragmented, muted. But tomorrow can be different. We can reconnect with the rhythms and help nature flourish. We call it rewilding. It turns up the volume on nature, allowing it to grow and flow, bloom and boom. Filling our landscapes with a riot of colour and song, the great web of life that supports our health and well-being. Rewilding gives us the chance to create a future where the links can roam and rivers run wild, where birds fly free and woodlands thrive where we move in tune with those magnificent beats and the wonder of life bursts back to our land and seas. <laughs>